beyond the basics. What does that mean? Well, the basics of Vedic astrology are number one, knowing what the planets mean, what they represent. Look at them as conscious energies, conscious aspects of yourself, because they are, because uh, everything is a reflection of you. And don't treat them as something external to you. When you do mantra, when you do meditation, whenever you consciously learn about the planets or work with the planets, you are working with discovering, awakening an aspect of yourself. So in time, as you, the more you study astrology, the more you start to see everything in some way, shape, or form as an aspect of you. But you have to know, what part of me is rules over bathtubs? What part of me rules my vehicle? What part of me rules my uh, spouse? What part of me rules musical instruments? What part of me rules my health? In general. And all of those are indicated by a particular planet. So know what the planets mean, what they represent as karakas. Uh, in the um, Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, Volume 2, in the very back, I have an entire list of possible karaka indications uh, based on the planets in houses, in um, as their natural indications, and also in Vargas. It's, it's, it's not exhaustive, but I spent a lot of time considering it and researching it, so it gives you very indications of what these planets represent um, just by being Jupiter. What does Jupiter mean by being in the birth chart? What does Jupiter mean when he's in the uh, Sidamsha? What does Jupiter mean when he's in the um, Chattertumsha? He represents something specific, and that is an aspect of you represented by Jupiter. So we have to know these things. Once we know what these are, it makes reading the chart so much easier. You know, having Mars in bad dignity in the 10th house, well, what does Mars represent? Um, Mars can represent uh, our brothers or our, our siblings, uh, those peers that cause us to build up our courage. So Mars in bad dignity in the 10th can show that where do some of our problems come from? Possibly from those things, because that's what Mars represents. And if he rules the third house as well, that's especially true. We need to know what do the houses represent. These are the basics. If we know what the houses represent, then we can understand how each area of life functions. You know, the first house means something. The fifth house represents a certain area of life. Go back to these previous talks that we've given on the houses. Study, memorize as best you can what they mean. So that way when someone says, what's my likelihood of having children? And you go look at their fifth house and you see Saturn and Mars is there. And you see that um, it's also getting hemmed in by Rahu and the sun, um, or malefic mercury in the sun, well then you know that that area of life is going to have some difficulties, um, looking at the fifth house, because that deals with children. If you want to know, someone says, what about my career? Well then you know to look at the second house, look at the tenth house, because those are two areas that show how we earn our living, as well as the kind of activity that we take. So you have to know the houses, you have to know the planets. Um, once you know that, then you have the foundation, because then you can start putting them together, weaving them together. Then you take it a step further, and you start learning what are what are the, what does it mean to have the dignity of a planet? What does the dignity mean? Uh, enemy, great enemy, um, neutral, molotricona, friend, exalted, debilitated. What do those things mean? And they'll start giving you a sense of how are the planets going to work in the person's chart. The next um, aspect that you want to consider uh, is the strength of Shadbala, the strength of the planet. And then you start incorporating the Avashtas, such as the Baladi Avashta, what is the state of karmic fruition of a planet, the Jagradi Avashta, how much is this planet going to give um, in regards to its help or hurting, whether it's a friend or an enemy. And the Lajitadi Avashtas, what is going to be the dynamic interaction of the planets. Um, you know, having Jupiter and Mars in the second house, well, that's delight from Mars to Jupiter and Jupiter and Mars in the second house, a house of wealth. And so that Lajitadi of Ashta, if both these planets are strong, are going to show that wisdom of Jupiter and the rationality of Mars are going to come together to make this person uh, a force to be reckoned with when it comes to financial things. Lots of grace, but a lot of energy and willpower, a lot of wisdom and willpower. Two things, when they come together, show great success. Lajitadi of Ashtas can help us see this. Um, the deep tadi of ashtas, and that really goes back to uh, uh, dignity. But you start getting these basics, and then you can really understand what a chart means. Looking at things like the ascendant, 
sign, that's good. The moon sign, the sun sign, that's all good. But too often, people send me notes saying, like for example, in regards to the debate from the tropical to sidereal zodiac. Well, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that this one works because my sun sign makes more sense here. And that's all they look at. We have to remember that the ascendant sign, that forms the foundation. We also have to consider what planets are impacting that ascendant, what planets are in the angles. So all these things that make you think, um, oh, I must be a Gemini ascendant. Well, maybe your Mercury is extremely strong, you know? So there are different there are different aspects that you have to weave together to figure all this out. But overall, these are the basics. Once you get these basics down, and again, most of these basics we've covered in this free uh, introductory course here on YouTube, the previous 51 videos in this course, that's when you really start making a serious study of the Vargas. Because once you understand what the Rashi represents, that same, those same principles are going to translate over to uh, the Vargas. And then you can start making a serious study of the Vargas. So the Vargas would be the next step. And after that, then you start exploring Dashas. Because once you know how the birth chart works and then the Vargas work, then you can start seeing how Dashas work. Um, beyond that, then you start incorporating transits with the dashes. And you really need to look at multiple charts. You need to take one principle at a time and apply it to at least 10 charts. See what results you get, see how you understand it. If you do that with every major principle that you learn, you will start to have an amazing grasp of astrological influences. So, you know. Personally, I don't think I really gave a very good reading until um, I had been studying astrology and practicing in this way um, for at least, what, four years? And even then, when I look back now, I don't think they were very good readings, um, but clients appreciated them. And, you know, as the years have progressed, personally, I still feel like I know hardly anything. The more I study Brihat Parashar Shastra, the more I study Jaimini, the more I meditate and realize how these different practices come together, you know, prajna, um, these sorts of things, the more I realize, wow, this is an immense subject. So the more I learn, the less I feel I know, which in a way feels good because then there's this endless wealth of knowledge to explore. And then as you go, you also start to see how different things apply in different situations. So experience is really the key here and using multiple charts is the key. But once you get the basics, then you go into the Vargas. Once you go into the Vargas, then you start looking at dashas and transits. And the more you do this, the more the chart reveals itself to you. And there are other avashtas um, that I personally haven't even uh, explored yet. For example, the, the Shainadi avashtas, also mentioned in Brihat Parashara Horashastra. Um, Ernst Wilhelm is currently working on those. But for me, it takes me a while to digest something, which means that after I learn something, I take a long time to explore it. And I'm not, um, I don't just take something and run with it. I apply it a bit first because I'm skeptical. You know, when I first started studying with Mr. Wilhelm, a lot of things he, he was saying, I thought, you know, this is a little bit convoluted. Um, I don't really think he's making much sense here. But I always found that the more I sat with it, because I would always sit with it, as the months went by, I would start to see how the points worked. So you might find that to be true too. Whereas now you're completely confounded. You think, well, how am I supposed to synthesize the fact that I need to look at the fourth house to determine what my relationship with my mother is going to be like? I need to look at the state of the moon to see that as well. Um, I need to look at the influences on all these things. I need to look to see where the uh, fourth lord goes. It seems like a lot. But you're expanding your mind, you know, you're expanding your consciousness to perceive and understand these things. And just like anything else, whether you're exercising or learning something new, um, there's going to be a period of, of pain where you're learning and growing, but eventually it settles in. And don't hesitate to also take breaks. Sometimes you just need to let it go so that your, the rest of your consciousness can process it. And then you come back to it a couple weeks or a couple months later and you pick it up again and you look at it and you think, ah, now I see, this makes perfect sense. So. Keep in mind, just like exercise, sometimes you need a break to let things catch up within your consciousness. But these are, this is what I would consider to be what you need to understand about the basics and how to move beyond the basics. And if you can do that, 
and let the years continue to carry you forward with the study of astrology, and you have a sense of service about it, whether you're trying to figure it out for yourself or to help others, um, in time it'll make more sense to you. And there are numerous schools of astrology out there. And I found that it's really dependent on the astrologer in regards to how, how it works. Um, I think eventually there, are, there is going to be a consistent application science of astrology where it doesn't matter if this teacher says that or this teacher says that. There's going to be like a, a law, like you, know, you drop something and it falls, the law of gravity. I think in time, the more we all give our all to this, um, we'll start to come upon these similar rules. Uh, similar laws, and whether that's coming from a Western astrologer or a Vedic astrologer or a Jaimini or a Parashara, as the yugas go by, it'll move into a singular science. But in the meantime, you know there are plenty of schools. You can find the one that works best for you, and try not to be too judgmental about other schools because you never know. Um, that person that is promoting a different kind of astrology might have some kind of inner knowledge or inner knowing that you're not aware of, or it doesn't apply to you. And again, this is the difficulty with uh, astrology in our current age, is that there's so many ideas out there, and so many traditionalists, and it's interesting how tradition goes, because you know we let everything else evolve, like our sciences, our health system, um, our music, but like when it comes to religion, and astrology is very much a religion, we're very resistant to it. So I would like to encourage you to, once you get some of these basics under your belt, start testing them. Get your own results write about it, share it with others, and eventually we'll have a whole body of knowledge that maybe we can all pull upon and find those singular threads that don't just make sense for one astrologer, but make sense for all astrologers. And that'll be a really interesting day. Um, I think it's a ways off because consciousness is complex and how we view the world is complex and sometimes we resonate with a particular tradition, idea, or aspect based on our current state of um, consciousness, but we're getting there. and. Um, I'm really excited to be uh, participating in astrology at this time because of the potential, because of how it's growing, because of the understanding is, is widening. Now, if only we can get um, many qualified astrologers to commit to testing one technique at a time, that would be excellent. So if any of you um, happen to be uh, wealthy philanthropists of astrology, uh, I always thought it would be fun to start a uh, an organization or a nonprofit organization specifically dedicated to um, testing astrological influences. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll all do it on our own and um, enjoy the process. So thank you for taking this course. Thank you for spending the time to explore uh, Vedic astrology. Uh, if you are just now coming to this video and you haven't experiencing the previous ones. There are 51 other videos before this, um, all beginning with the basics, sticking with the basics as a survey course to give you information to become a good astrologer. And the reason I did this was because I saw that there was a, a very, there was a need uh, to get us all on the same page. And, um, you know, I do teach classes and I also um, lead webinars that I charge money for because, you know, this is my work and I do have um, responsibilities financially and otherwise. But I, I made this course because I wanted people to have the capacity and the access to learning these principles. That way when they start getting involved in deeper study, they'll have a good foundation to pull upon. And this is also based on the book, The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology. Um, I don't have an updated copy here, I'd show it to you. But The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology by Ryan Kurzak and Richard Fish, Volume 1. Um, so everything that we've gone over in this course is also written down in that, uh, in that book. And The Art and Science of Vedic Astrology, Volume 2, will hopefully be out soon. Uh, editing definitely always seems to take more time than I think. And uh, that's going to have some interesting additional, what you might consider, what I consider to be intermediate techniques, intermediate principles. It's also going to speak about the Lajitati of Ashtas and describe each Lajitati of Ashta, how it works, uh, as well as uh, house lord combinations. So that's going to be, in my mind, a desk reference for astrologers. And that's one of the reasons I wrote it selfishly, um, because I do reference a lot of things when I do a chart. And it always drove me nuts having to jump through you know, five different books to cross-reference things. So what I decided to do was put it all in one thing, so therefore it's right on my desk. And... Um, 
I can just flip to it. For example, here is the uh, here is the uh, what you might call the the manuscript. And it's about 400 pages at the moment. But now, you know, I've got the manuscript, so I use this again. They're all things that I've worked out and written down, how I've seen astrology work. So I'm doing someone's chart. If I forgot a principle, I just get out my book, flip right to it, and there it is. Um, so we all need these sorts of things. I think they're very helpful. And try not to get too concerned if you can't memorize everything, because you know, it's just with that being said, obviously I can't memorize everything either, and there's a lot to memorize. But as the years go by, it gets more and more in your consciousness. But books are very helpful. So anyway, uh, again, it was a pleasure. And I'm going to take a break from videos for now, I think. I might go back to the Kriya Yoga online, um, youtube.com slash Kriya Yoga online, and start working on some more uh, meditation videos. But I do think I'm going to take a break from uh, astrology videos for now. Uh, finish up this book, finish up some classes, and then we'll see maybe what a next series might bring. So be well, and thank you very much.